slavery and captivity. You know the difference? Well, this one, this one's always going to be for us after we know him. This one will always be that there was a warning. I got to tell you something. From the time that I ever was writing, you know, I come from a very, very difficult past. And um, I was such a, just a, a, a hard road um, and God has been has so persevered with me and been so gracious to me and over time taught these uh, very, very broken legs how to uh, be healed and how to begin to walk on the road instead of constantly tumbling in the ditch like I did in my younger years. And I'm so, so grateful to him. But I, I started when I, when I wrote When Godly People Do Ungodly Things, because there really is, there is a spirit of seduction. And listen, the enemy, uh, warfare is hardball, but seduction is curveball. It's that you did not see it coming. I mean, it's something that hits you from the side, and I mean, you're like drunk on it before you know it. Anybody where you just think like, man, I could hardly even think. It could be like an affair in your workplace. That, I mean, like, you cannot even think. And, I mean, you have loved God since childhood, and you are wigged out in an affair. It is one of those times when God is going, where are you? And you're in another man's bed. And it's like, what am I doing here? This is what we're talking about. So I interviewed one person after the next, and I've done it. I've continued to do it all these years, long after I wrote the book, long after I wrote the book. I've continued to ask the same question of believers, not to those that were in in, um, slavery. In other words, they had never come to know Christ. But those who are in Christ, the Holy Spirit does his job. He does his job. There's no way he's not harassing us, holy harassment from the inside when we're wigged out in sin. He does his job. He does his job. And so... I ask over and over again, did you get a warning? Did you get a warning? Was something in you, did something in you go, oh man, this is going to be trouble? Something where at the very beginning when you still have some kind of brains, anybody? You can think well enough to go, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh, I better move back from this. And then we don't resist it and in we go. What differs between captivity and slavery, we do better. We knew better. That's why this one, for me personally, this does not drive me near as crazy in my own journey with God as this one. I knew better when I was in this mess. I knew better. It wasn't even in my heart to do, I would have thought. I mean, it's like, I loved God. And then just got caught in depravity. Or for someone else, it might be an addiction, whatever it is. It's like, what am I doing here? And for somebody today, this is your day out. This is your day out. And you make your thing, some of you are thinking, no, it'll kill me. It'll nearly kill me. No, God's going to be so good to you, but you're going to have to trust him like you do back in the wilderness because, right, you're going to be going through that again where you're in a wilderness trying to get back to your place of abounding. You do not belong in captivity. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Get your tail out of it. Get your tail out of it. It is time for you to be back in your place of abounding. It is all that will matter. That's what's going to matter when you get home. That's what's going to matter from eternity to eternity. The first landmark in captivity are idols, always, always. There is always something we have made another God when we are in captivity. Always, always, always. It's either idol or idols. The the next one is an increasingly heavy yoke. Like at first, we may think, oh, man, I feel free. I feel free. But the thing about it is the longer that we are held captive, when we are believers in Christ, the longer we are held captive to sin, the heavier and heavier and heavier that yoke gets. What are our directions? The very first direction is so beautiful and so simple. Repent. Repent. I'm going to tell you something, church. The scariest thing that could happen to us is for us to lose the word repentance from our vocabulary. Do you understand that repentance is our right? He said, preach, 
repentance from sin and forgiveness of sins throughout all generations. Preach the gospel. And part of the call of the gospel is you are invited to come, repent of your sins. Just turn around, turn away from it and go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. And Acts chapter 3 says, then times of refreshing will come. Listen, there's nothing like it. When I repent and I confess my sins, I, the Word of God says in 1 John 1, 9, I am completely purified. I mean, like you stand up from there and it's like, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. These may be clean. Repent. It was exactly even what Solomon prayed when he dedicated the temple in Jerusalem. He said, and if we go after other gods and if we wander from this place, if we repent with all of our heart and all of our soul in the land of our captivity where we are carried captive and we pray toward that land, and then hear from heaven from your dwelling place. Maintain our cause. Forgive us. Bring us back. Repent. Take down the next few. Submit to God. Just submit to him. Okay, Lord, I'm just like, I'm yours. To, to me, I see this. I see submitting. If I'm going to think of it as a posture, to me, it's bowing. That I'm just like, I'm bowed down to you. I have made, Lord, I've made such a mess of my life. And I'm just telling you from my own testimony, places that I've been with him when I've just said to him, I've made such a mess. I don't even, I don't know how to fix it. I don't even know how to tell you to be God here. But I'm going to tell you, I repent. I've really messed up. And I submit myself to you. And the third one is endure discipline faithfully. Endure discipline faithfully. Hebrews chapter 12, I want you to hear something. This has just been life to me. I love it so much when it talks about the discipline of God, that he disciplines those he loves in verse 6 of Hebrews 12. But listen to where it says this, 11 through 13. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. What is lame may not be dislocated but healed instead. Listen, listen carefully because this was so, so uh, consoling to me that when God is bringing me through a time of discipline and when, when some of the consequences of it are really, really hard, getting over an addiction, withdrawals, the things that we go through, we need support, we need people around us, and it, it can be tough. God can deliver us in an instant, deliver us from all yearning for that to which we've been addicted, but many times it's also just a a, a day in, day out, I have to trust you. Give me this day my daily bread. This day my daily strength. I will make it on you this day. I don't know what happens in five years, but this day I'm going to trust you. And this night I'm going to hold close to you. I want to get through the night on you. That We just continue and we endure and we endure. But what he says is the whole purpose of that kind of discipline, of divine discipline, is that that which has been broken would be healed. Listen, something, when, when we find ourselves in a really big enslavement in captivity, something's broken somewhere that needs healing. Something's broken. Find out what. And know that your God is after healing you. This one is so important, and I put it in all caps, and I want you to put it in all caps too. And do you know I've got such a lump in my throat, I can hardly say it to you. Never forget how loved you are. Never forget how loved you are. When you're going through a time where you're getting over something that of tremendous foolishness in your life, when you know, see, there's the thing about captivity is, is what we, we asked for it. That's one reason it's the hardest part of my testimony is I look back and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this wasn't a hardship that was brought on me. I mean, I, I asked for this. Somehow, I mean, this was a decision I made. I got myself in this mess, and it can be so, it can be so de demoralizing. So the most important thing that we could possibly remember when we're there is, you know what? At no point in the worst of my sin was I ever loved one iota less. Never, not for one second. 
Not for one second did you cool off the heart of God toward you. He, he is incapable of, he cannot love you less or more. He, he is complete. God is love. So for him to love less, he has to be less God because God is love. So you'd have to detract, you'd have to subtract from God's godness to be loved less because you'd have to make him less than who he is because God is love. I have one question to ask you. Anybody sick to death of anxiety? Anybody sick to death of worrying about everything under the sun? Can you attest to being a basket case from time to time? From the minute the day starts, life provides plenty of opportunities for anxiety to creep in. But did you know God's Word can equip you to overcome that cycle? Living Proof Ministries wants to offer you one of our most popular resources to help you throw off anxiety and begin walking in freedom. It's called The Basket Case, and as a thank you for your donation, you will receive this three-part teaching and digital companion action guide available for immediate access on your smartphone, tablet, or computer. Visit bethmore.org forward slash donate to download this resource today and win the battle over your mind. Visit bethmore.org forward slash donate. Living Proof Ministries is so pleased to partner with the Voice of the Martyrs as they teach us how to come alongside our persecuted brothers and sisters who serve Jesus in areas of the world closed to the gospel. I love the Voice of the Martyrs' core ministry verse. It's out of Hebrews 13. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them. Part of the Voice of the Martyrs' mission is to call the body of Christ to remember our persecuted Christian family members by fervently praying and providing support for them. Today, as a blessing to you, the Voice of the Martyrs will send you a free copy of their book, Hearts of Fire, when you visit their website. You will be impacted by eight women in the underground church and their stories of costly faith. Would you join me in linking arms with the Voice of the Martyrs to further the gospel? We would be so grateful. We believe that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. That Jesus Christ came in the flesh to seek and to save the lost. And we have come to testify that this Jesus still transforms lives, still sets captives free, heals the brokenhearted, defends the oppressed, revives the souls of the weary, and renews our anxious minds. You and I have been called to freedom. In a world inundated with bad news, there's good news. Discover hope and joy in the scriptures. Come and find community. And worship the King. Experience generations of women opening the Word of God. Come with us to Living Proof Live. Join us in a city near you. I think I want you in Psalm 19, but I just want you to lay it open for a little while and let me talk to you for a few minutes. Remember, perhaps, earlier I told you that we were going to end our time together in abounding. We've talked about four different locations. We've been using our Bibles as our location app. We've been opening it up, looking for life application. That's where our app comes from, looking for life application in the Word of God, trying to answer the question, if God were to ask us, where are you? Or like he said to Elijah, has this gone through your mind at any point this weekend? Elijah, what are you doing here? This, and and for, for many of us, okay, this is, yes, okay, I'm in abounding. I just thought it wasn't supposed to hurt at all. I, I didn't think there was supposed to be any kind of fight here, but there is. Okay, this, that's, that's good. That's good. I get it now. I get it, and I'm refreshed in it. Maybe that we've decided, no, I'm somewhere I don't want to be, but I know where I'm supposed to be. And I know where, by His divine power, God has called me to be. And so there were four places, and I want to hear all four of them before we settle on the third one. We've got, first of all, what? And then? We've got deliverance and then abounding. abounding, and then we've got, and so what we're going to try to do for the rest of our life is hopefully stay out of captivity. Psalm 25, verse 15, see it? You might mark it because this is really wonderful for someone that wants to just really stay in 
the uh, land of abounding because it says in verse 15, my eyes are always on the Lord for he will pull my feet out of the net. One of the things I ask him to do continually for my children, my grandchildren, and, and my husband and I is that he would just snatch our feet out of a net that if somehow we have stepped into a trap, that we will know it quickly. One of the things, if you're a parent, one of the things you want to pray for your kids and then don't despise it when it happens, pray that they get caught early on. Pray that because the, the earlier we get caught when we're heading toward a pit, the better. So we, we want, that's, that's not a bad thing. Don't shame them to death if they get caught taking something small, just understand, isn't God good because you got caught way over here? Now let's work this through and let's call it what it is and let's sort it out and come to a place of repentance and come to a place of, of restoring this and understand that God caught you early. If you catch him cheating, pray that God caught him early. So we want that and we want that for us. Lord, convict me early. It's, it's hard to know how we're really doing here because if you're like me, it looks so messy. My, my own life looks so messy to me. But one thing that does help us is how much time lapses between sin and repentance. That is really helpful. How long can I go when I've talked really ugly about someone before I'm kind of like pierced in the heart about it? You know what I'm talking about? Like how quickly does it go, okay, that was really off base. That was really off base. Fun for a moment, yes, but really off base. You know what I'm talking about? So it just, that kind of thing gives us a little bit of an idea, but where we want to be is abounding, abounding. Now, I got to tell y'all something. We've got, what do we have up here? We've got our, and this is representative of our place of abounding. 20 times in the Old Testament, God put it in these words. He called the land of promise, or he called Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. Now, one of the things that you and I have talked about that's so important is that the manna wasn't laying on the ground, and the water wasn't gushing from a rock, and the quail wasn't flying in the evening. Instead, he was like, I've given you cows, go milk them. I've given you what we're going to learn today is bees and honeycomb. Go drain it. Now, i got to tell you all something. Some of you, if you keep up at all on Instagram, you already know this, but I am a novice beekeeper. I'm only one year old in my beekeeping, and I don't mind telling you, it is one of the most fun things I've ever done. And listen, it has not been all fun and games because I got a bee stuck in my hair Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Right in the top. And, you know, it just kept stinging its way out. It was upset. I was upset. We just, you know, we were like, out, out with you, out with you. And it was like, it, it, it was trying to flee for its life. It was going like, I have never been in such a trap in my life. You, uh, you talk about a bee that is just like crying out with Psalm 25, remove my hair, remove her hair from my feet. That was us. So, I mean, it's, but I've, I have a really good friend that, that, um, Work, that plants flowers in our yard from time to time. And she's just fascinating, a fascinating person. And her whole thing, I mean, anything landscaping, anything. It, she lives to watch stuff grow. And so this is one of her loves. And she said, Beth, I'm going to teach you how to beekeep. I said, do it. <laughs> and so we started about 14 months ago. And you know, you start with the flow hive. And it goes from there. And so we got our own bees from our own area. She said, all of these, all of these. She said, you've got a great queen. I said, I want a great queen. <laughs> you've got a great queen. Oh, I'm so happy to have a great queen. And then collects all these bees. They're just buzzing all the time. And they're right about, oh, I'd say we live out in the country, but I'd say what you consider about a, um, a, a city block from our front door. And I, I am obsessed with it. Absolutely obsessed. But this is our first year to have an actual honey harvest because it's taken all this time. They've been building up. We've been watching it through the glass. And it's just crazy because you can just hear them humming and working inside of it. And, and, and so we've done the whole thing. And I brought a little video. And I, I'm going to show it to you, but I want you to understand something. This is the very first time I got to do it. All right. It should start coming out. All right. So this is what I did. Here it comes. Is it coming? Here it comes. It's coming faster than the other time. This is so exciting. 
y'all, honestly, it was the funnest thing. I got jar after jar after jar. I just need you to know this right here is my own honey from my own bees. And you know, I've got to tell you something. It's given me such insight into the land of milk and honey. One of the things that's very exciting that I, I learned this week that I wanted to bring to you is that for a long time, it was believed that the honey in reference to the land of milk and honey was that which would come from like figs or dates. They felt like it was that kind of honey instead of bee honey because they just didn't really have a reference in the Old Testament to actual beekeeping and they thought maybe it's just that, that, that kind of honey. And, um, but in 2007, there was a particular, uh, it's called Tel Rehav, Tel Rehav, and it is in the uh, Jordan River Valley in the northern part of Israel where they had been doing an archaeological dig, a, a group out of Hebrew University, and they dug up an apiary that had at first, they first found like, I think it was like 30 um, different uh, uh, hives, and then they would ultimately discover a hundred. And it would have been, it dates all the way back to King Solomon's reign. And why that's so important is because with the establishment of the temple, he is the king that God had put on the throne when the temple would be established. So it was officially the dwelling of Israel in the land of promise. And so there, were, there would have been all of these hives. And so they're saying now, oh, no, that wasn't just date and fig honey. That is bee honey. I learned from my research that it would have produced an estimated half a ton of honey every single year. Half a ton of honey every year, just what they found there alone. So it was just stunning. We know all these years pass and then the New Testament era opens with the very last of those Old Testament prophets with the mouth of John the Baptist going, repent and make way for the Lord. And we know about him that it wasn't crackers and honey for him. It was, he had a little bit of crunch with locusts. I reckon he just <laughs> dipped his locusts right in. You know, it probably made a little cup. You know what I'm saying? Just dipped it right in. And just like, it had all the elements, a little bit of crunch, a little bit of soft, absolute perfection. And that's what he ate. And this is this wild man coming out with this wild honey. And Scripture uses it, you're in Psalm 19, Scripture uses it as a gorgeous metaphor several times, but specifically right here, I want to read to you Psalm 19, starting at verse 7. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, renewing one's life. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy making the inexperienced wise. Do you know what that's saying? We don't have to learn everything by experience. There is another way as well, and that's that we can have more wisdom than our experience because we're people of the word. We're, we're people that receive the instruction. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad. If we're really studying the word of God with the spirit um, alive and active in us, then, then it makes our hearts glad. Yes, we'll sorrow with repentance and then we'll get on with it. We'll repent and get on with it and have our gladness and our joy. The command of the Lord is radiant, making the eyes light up. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are reliable and altogether righteous. They are more desirable than gold and an abundance of pure gold. And here it is, and sweeter than honey dripping from a honeycomb. In addition, your servant is worn by them and in keeping them, there is abundant reward. Do you see both sides of it, of being in the word of God, of really studying the word of God? He says, by it, you can receive a warning. You'll know, uh-uh, I'm heading to trouble. But also by it, there is great reward. So it is that like 
I want to keep away from this, but man, I want this. I want this. It's a beautiful portion in Ezekiel chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3 where the Lord comes to Ezekiel in this vision and says to him, he hands him a scroll and he says to him, eat this scroll. I love the translation that just says, eat this book. And he said, so I ate it and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. There's a saying uh, through the centuries of being honey-tongued. And that's just to have sweetness on your tongue. I, I pray out of Proverbs 31 often. It's one of the lists of scriptures that I lay out with my journal, and I, I pray out of it on a regular basis. And it says that the law of kindness is on our tongue. I'm not always kind, but I want to be. I want to be. I want there to be honey on my tongue, and I want it to come from the scriptures. And I think you want that as well. It's this beautiful, beautiful promise that is here. This beautiful picture that is here. There's so much bitterness in life. And I think that one of the last things I want to say to you today is that it's time we demand our sweetness back. Living Proof Ministries would like to send you a thank you gift for your donation. Visit BethMoore.org forward slash donate. Thank you so much for watching today. Man, it is our joy to serve you at Living Proof Ministries. We do not take a single one of you for granted. Click subscribe so that you don't miss a moment of our time together in scripture. We'll see you back on the channel very soon.